Hey guys, and welcome back! Oh, hi Mark! I think I got my first PC back in 1998. It was a Pentium 166. It had 32 megabytes of RAM and a 1 megabyte graphics card, not to mention a 1.6 gigabyte hard drive. Even with this hard drive, it's kind of amazing to see the progress of technology. A 1.6 gigabyte hard drive, a good few pounds in weight. Now you can buy a 256 gigabyte micro SD card and it's the size of your fingernail. But this was a great Christmas present. It really taught me about computers, how they fit together, how they work. And I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I always used to like to take things apart to work out how they worked. And it was this first PC that taught me so much. Just trying things out with hardware and software, making mistakes, but learning from your mistakes. And yeah, since about 1998, I've been building my own PCs. For me, a PC is something I don't mind spending money on. It's games, it's email, it's it's internet, it's video editing, it's music, it's Netflix, and I really like how modular they are where you can keep upgrading different parts, and I generally never throw any of these parts away, which brings us to today's video. These days with PCs, games went digital a long time ago, before consoles, but I do still have a decent stash of games. Another big strength of the PC is backwards compatibility. With consoles these days, maybe you'll get backwards compatibility with the last generation, maybe the one before that, but it's generally only limited. With PCs, you can probably play games that were made in the 1980s, probably no trouble at all. Not to mention all the emulation of all the consoles as well. But with these old games, there's kind of an obvious problem. PCs these days don't generally ship with DVD drives. Maybe you'll get a Blu-ray drive, but that's becoming less and less common. You can get USB DVD drives to play these games as well. However, you might get the odd one that plays up. Some of these games have since been patched to work with modern operating systems. Or maybe you can buy them as digital downloads from GOG, good old games, or even on Steam. Some of these games use some awful copy protection. Don't know if you guys remember Star Force, it was a CD and DVD copy protection routine. It was an absolute pain, and you had to have the original DVD or CD in the drive at all times. So you might find that the game itself is actually compatible with modern operating systems, but it's the copy protection that isn't. But I don't want to buy the games I already own again digitally, so let's put together a retro PC to play some of these old classics. So I did have a bit of inspiration for this video, I came across this picture, it's dated 2001, and this would have been my PC at the time, a Rhapsody in lovely beige. We've got a massive CRT monitor that probably weighs as much as a small house, and look how thick that scanner is on the far right side of the desk. A modern scanner's probably about a third of that height, so I'm going to put together something that's got the components of this PC, but I want something that looks modern. So similar internal PC hardware, but no beige boxes. First up is the case, and this is a Lian Lee case, and it's got the rather stupid name of PC-A05FN. Catchy. But this case will take full-size ATX motherboards, and it has two front drive bays, as well as space for a floppy drive bay. Uh, I'm not too sure if we want to go quite that old, though. I had plenty of spare parts already, but I thought I'd take a quick look on eBay, and I found this. This was advertised as a socket A motherboard and CPU, but it's actually a slot A motherboard and CPU. These are actually getting harder to find and going up in price. And I paid just £35 for both. And this series of chips were the original Athlon processors. And it was this series of CPUs that were the first to break the 1000 MHz or 1 GHz barrier. This model clocks in at 800 MHz. And in my PC at the time, I probably had a Duron 700 MHz. So yeah, let's go with this. Next up is the RAM. And I would have only had 64 megs or maybe 96 megs of RAM back in the day. But I managed to find four sticks of 256 megs each. Now we've only got three RAM slots on this motherboard, but 768 megs of RAM, that's a nice improvement over my original. So this is standard SD RAM, this is before double data rate DDR1, 2, 3 and 4. And if you notice with the memory chips underneath it there's some smaller chips. This is actually ECC RAM or error code correction, it's commonly found in servers, or at least was back then. Thankfully the motherboard I've got is completely compatible with this, so yeah. Sounds good to me. Generally it's easier to fit the CPU and memory in the motherboard while it's out of the case, so I'm just going to do that now and then we'll move on to the rest of the build. Let's start with graphics cards. And it's kind of the law that you've got to have a 3DFX card in there. And this is a PCI Voodoo 3. After the 1MB Diamond Stealth card that came with the system, I upgraded to a Voodoo Rush, or should I say I was given a Voodoo Rush. It ran some games but the compatibility was pretty rubbish. So shortly after I got my first PC for Christmas, I went to PC World and I bought this graphics card. It's clocked at 143 MHz, has 16 MB of onboard RAM, but it can only display 16-bit colour graphics in 3D games. So there was a reason for going for the PCI Voodoo 3. That leaves us a free AGP slot for an AGP graphics card. And whilst you can't run both at the same time in 3D games, 
It will allow me to switch between the two, so I've got a retro PC that has two retro graphics cards that I can switch between. And I've chosen the Hercules Prophet 4500, and this card has 64 megabytes, and this uses the Cairo chipset. I upgraded from the Voodoo 3 to this card, so having them both in the system at the same time is going to be awesome. When this card was released, the GeForce 2 was out, and that was a much more expensive graphics card than this. However, in certain situations, this graphics card was actually faster. It did this through its tile-based rendering. Now, the motherboard does have two onboard USB ports, but these are only USB 1.1. So the next expansion card is a USB 2 PCI card. Now this particular card was a bit of a pain to find. I needed a USB card that had the front panel header so I could connect it to my case's front panel, and I also needed one with an internal USB 2 header which you can see at the top right. This is going to be used shortly to give us a nice little workaround. Onto the sound card, and this is probably the only part of the system that I'm not particularly happy with. I did want a creative sound blaster card that supports the EAX audio extensions. These give you things like nice echoes in games. So for example, if you're in a larger room, you get echoes and things like that. It really does improve the game. But this card is a little bit too new, really. There are some older cards that support this, the Sound Blaster Live, Live Value and Audigy 2. And whilst I do have these cards, they don't have the front panel audio connector that you can see at the top right hand side. That's going to give us our audio out on the front and the microphone in. The other cards do support this, but you need a special adapter, which I don't have. As this is a really old PC, it has no SATA ports on the board, only IDE connections. And we've got two DVD ROMs and we've got two hard drives to connect. This card has two internal ports and one on the outside. I do have some of the older IDE type hard drives, but these are getting really old now and they're starting to fail. But with the serial ADA ports, I've got a bunch of these drives that I can use. And it also gives me the option to use solid state disks down the line if I choose. Onto our final expansion card, and this is a wireless card. This supports wireless N and apparently up to 150 megabits. I'm not sure how wise putting a PC this old on a really old operating system online is, but it's just a bit of fun, make it easier to download drivers and stuff. Onto hard drives and I've got two matching 80 gigabyte models. A company I used to work at would regularly throw away their PC stuff and I'd always raid the junk pile before it did. So over the years I've saved a lot of stuff and repurposed stuff. I can't bear to see any of this old stuff go to the tip, especially if it can be used. And yet, these two SATA hard drives came from that junk pile and they work absolutely fine. Samsung drives as well, so should be good quality. Like I say, we can go solid state drives down the line, but for now, I want a proper hard drive. Onto the optical drives. And my original PC we saw at the start would have had two drives, a CD drive and an early DVD drive. So yeah, because of that, I'm having two DVD drives in this one as well. These also use the serial ATA interface, and we've already used our two internal ports on our SATA card for the hard drives, so we're going to have to find a new solution for this. And yet, these also came from the X-Work junk pile. I think in my garage I must have about 10 SATA DVD drives, and these were just going to be thrown away, so I can't bear them to get thrown, so yeah, they came home with me. Okay, I think we're good to go, so let's put this thing together. I have added a modern Corsair power supply to this build. You do need to be a bit careful with these old systems. Although they don't use as much power as a modern PC, they do put more demand on the 5 volt rail on the power supply than a modern PC. And these modern power supplies aren't really expecting that, so hopefully we're going to be okay with this. Let's start with getting the motherboard, CPU and RAM in place. Next we'll add in our graphics cards, the AGP Cairo and the PCI 3DFX Voodoo 3. Our USB 2 card goes next. I'm attaching a cable to this. This is for the ports on the front of the PC, so I'll have USB 2 access on the front. So if I want to attach a USB hard drive to this system to copy files, I can do so, rather than use the old really slow USB 1 ports the motherboard has. If you're wondering what that thing with Logic 3 written on it is at the bottom of the case, it's actually a USB speaker. And because our USB card has an internal port, I can power the speaker through this. This just gives me another option in case I don't want to set up speakers each time I want to use this system. So essentially it's got internal audio as well. Onto the sound card, and it took a little bit of fiddling getting this in with all the cables in the way, but we got there in the end. I'm attaching a separate cable to the sound card. This attaches to the front of the case and allows me to plug in headphones or a microphone. We plug our serial ATA card in next, and this also has an external connector. This connects to the front of the case and just shows us when the hard drive's being accessed. Basically, it's a little LED that lights up when the drive's being used. Finally, we add in the wireless card and screw the aerial onto the back. Like I say, I'm not sure if we'll use this, but it's handy to have. So this thing looks like it's already on life support with the amount of cables connected. There's a lot of stuff we take for granted on motherboards these days. Almost all of them will already have some sort of onboard audio, that already have SATA connectors, that already have USB 3. A lot already have wireless built in, 
and some of them might already have onboard basic graphics, but yeah, back in the day this is how we did things. Next we'll put our two hard drives in place. In hindsight it would have probably been easier to add these first and then add the graphics cards, but eh, I'm committed now. Next we need to attach them to the power supply by the two serial ATA power connectors. I've managed to find some shorter serial ATA cables, so I've used this to connect them to the serial ATA card. So now we've got power and data going to the drives. Next up is the main motherboard connector. I think modern power supplies are ATX 2.0 compatible, maybe it's moved on since then, but this motherboard is only compatible with the ATX1 standard. This main motherboard power connector can be split so it will work with the ATX1 standard, however the connector is still a bit bulky and it will get in the way of one of the capacitors on the motherboard, so for that reason I'm using an ATX2 to ATX1 converter. We can now add in our two DVD drives from earlier, we can slide these in from the front and we've got to make sure they're powered. So again, two serial ATA power connectors connected to the power supply. With our two DVD drives powered up, this leaves us with a small problem. The two DVD drives connect with serial ATA data cables. We've used both serial ATA connectors on our expansion card, so we can't use those. The motherboard itself has the IDE connectors, which are an older standard. So I went online and I found two converters that convert IDE to serial ATA. Now I could have just got a 4 port serial ATA card instead, but when you're trying to boot operating systems they kind of want drivers for these serial ATA cards and they're a real pain sometimes. So this solution basically means they'll work just as they were IDE drives connected to the system. No drivers needed and it should be fully compatible. Let's move to the outside of the case now, and we've got two DVD drives. They don't really match in with the silver aesthetic of the aluminium case, so let's put some covers on these. Let's move to the back of the case now, and yet there's a whole lot more wires here. I'll try my best to explain what's going on here. There's the two graphics cards, and I can connect either one of them with the blue cable. This connects to the HDMI converter, so I can use either card with a modern HDTV or monitor. There's also the red cable coming out of the sound card that also goes into the HDMI converter, so it transmits audio and video. The HDMI converter does need power, so there's this small USB cable plugged into the side, which is also powered off my USB 2 card. Finally, I've also included a USB to Ethernet adapter, so if I ever want to put it on a network, I can do. We're finally done with the inside of the case, so I can put the side panel on. This case is made of brushed aluminium, so it's a real upgrade from the old plastic beige faded case. For the final finishing touches, we need some case badges. Any decent retro PC needs these, Intel inside, powered by Nvidia, something like that. Thankfully on eBay there's a bunch of reproductions you can buy. I might have gone a little overboard here, but I think it looks great. We've got the Power VR for our Power VR Cairo card, we've got 3DFX for our Voodoo 3, AMD for our processor, and Gigabyte for our motherboard. I wasn't sure what operating system I was going to use at the time, Windows XP or Windows 2000 I thought, so I thought I'd get a case badge that covered both. Let's get the front PC panel in place and take a look at the full system. I'm really happy with how this turned out, it's exactly what I wanted, nice old retro hardware in a nice cool modern case. I did play with the idea of adding the floppy drive as well, but I never really used this much back in the day other than for sort of school homework, things like that. So here's what it looks like attached, but I decided to remove it. In the boxes in my garage I found an old stock keyboard and mouse. As we have a bunch of spare USB ports on our USB 2 card, yeah, I'm going to plug these in. I would like to try and find an older keyboard and mouse that used the PS2 standard. These are great, but they only work in Windows, they don't work in the BIOS. But hey, they look great, let's use them. Now this will divide opinion, I have no nostalgia whatsoever for old school CRT monitors, or even TVs, I think they're best consigned to history. So here is an old monitor from work, it's silver and it's a 4x3 aspect ratio, but it does have a nice flat screen, and yet this was also destined for the tip at one point. So did it boot first time? Of course not, but I've cleverly edited all that out. I won't cover the installation of an operating system, that's not particularly interesting. My initial plan was to go with Windows 2000, I think that was the best operating system Microsoft have ever released, it was really stable, it worked really well for multiple monitors, but I did run into some problems with the wireless card, the sound card and the serial ATA card. I do plan to install Windows 2000 eventually when I've got some different hardware, but for now let's go with trusty old Windows XP. Like I say, this isn't my first choice, but this operating system was just the one that would not die. And because it lasted so long, drivers are really easy to find for this operating system. I've installed some drivers on some basic applications, 
Here we can see our two graphics cards that I can switch between. And here's our 800 megahertz processor, or thereabouts. I'd like to get hold of some period correct applications for this PC at some point, but for now let's run a 3D test and see if everything works. This is 3D Mark 2001, and I think when we saw this back in the day, I think our jaws pretty much hit the floor. You've got to think back, this was even before the original Xbox was released in Europe. And although this system sort of struggles to run this nature scene here, it really gave an idea of what was to come. These days consoles are basically just PCs in a box, but I think at this point in time, PCs were so far ahead of consoles. And it was probably demos like this that made me sort of switch over to PCs for my main gaming. And let's give our internal USB speaker a go with some classic MIDI files. Now that's just perfection. I'm going to try and capture some of the video from this PC. I don't have a high-end capture card or anything like that, so I've just been on Amazon and I've bought a USB to HDMI capture device. And you can tell this is a high-quality Chinese device because when you look at the reviews and go to the pictures, there's a picture of a wooden rocking horse which someone has carved. Now how do you carve that with a USB device? Easy, you sell something on Amazon, get really good reviews and then change the product. But for the money it works well enough. Let's run a quick benchmark on these two graphics cards and put them against each other. Like I say, it's not a great video capture device, it does miss a lot of frames, but at the bottom left corner of the screen you'll see the frames per second each card is getting. The Voodoo 3 tends to sort of hover around 40 frames a second, and the Cairo 2 generally hits 60 plus. It's not all great fun coming back to the old systems though. Having to install all your games off CD or DVD, it takes ages. I think there's definitely space for digital downloads and physical media still. Buying games off Steam, you buy it, you right click, you click install, and that's it, it does it all itself. But back then you've got driver issues, you've got patches that you've got to manually download. But at least if you buy the game, you own the game. Not just a bunch of files on some server somewhere. Anyway, we've spent all the time getting this system built, testing it out, installing the drivers, so let's put together a montage of some games. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the episode. 
It was a little bit more about vintage hardware this time rather than games, but I've always enjoyed building PCs, making little upgrades. I'm going to leave you with a demo from 3D Mark 2000. It's probably the most iconic demo ever made for the PC. So let's give this PC a full workout and I'll see you next time.